All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here as always with Drew Dinsick. Today, Drew, we're going to talk Seahawks, Bengals. We're going to talk Lions, Bucks briefly on Giants, Bills, and then we'll close out with our best bets. But let's get started with Seahawks, Bengals. Uh, what did you think of uh, DK Metcalf saying Jamar Chase is pretty good, but uh, no match for Devin Witherspoon in what I believe will be maybe his fourth game in the NFL? Yeah, it'd be nice to know if Jamar Chase saw that. Oh, we know he saw it. I, my goodness gracious. I do, I, you know, there's no point in poking Jamar Chase right now. He's playing at an all time level. Um, and, you know, this is definitely a tougher test. Let's be completely frank. Like the style of defense that um, <clears throat> he's going to be facing here is, is def and, and in just in general, the quality of uh, defensive backs that'll be on the field for Seattle um, is, uh, is very different and is a higher quality than they faced against the Arizona Cardinals. So the likelihood that he is just going to be running amok in space 15, 10, 15 yards down the field is. Uh, is pretty low likelihood, I think. Um, I do like Tariq Woolen. I do like Devin Witherspoon. Um, although it's worth noting, there are a couple injuries going on with that Seahawks secondary. No Kobe Bryant, likely. Uh, tough to say uh, if you know how their depth will uh, will manage. But um, yeah, that was a uh, that was an unfortunate kind of wrinkle to add to the pie here. Um, the biggest kind of important discussion to be had about the Bengals right now is what can you expect from Joe Burrow. Uh, having watched his game against the Eagles now a couple of times, it's my opinion uh, that uh, whatever uh, limitations he had from the calf injury, um, he's learning to play around them. I don't think he's healthy. I'm not seeing him with the same mechanics that I recognized from him in years past. He's not using his back leg to push off on deep balls. He's using his front leg. It looks weird, but it's effective. Uh, and I think that there is a decent chance here that if he is asked to throw into tighter windows um, and, you know, he still is not 100 uh, percent in terms of, um, uh, you know, being able to utilize his back foot, then, you know, he might there might be kind of a halfway between what we saw in terms of production against the Cardinals and what he looked like through the first four weeks of the season, which was just nowhere close to what we remember from Joe Burrow. So in the back of my head, there's still some lingering expectation that he might not be 100 percent. Uh, and that this might not be perfect uh, performance for him because this is a tougher defense than the Cardinals. The other side of the coin, really, though, is the Bengals have virtually nothing going on right now in the running game, and the Seahawks are a masterful run defense, and so it is kind of going to be on his arm. Uh, I would expect 50 pass attempts here, and if he can't make those tight window throws uh, and or if, uh, you know, just in general, the... Uh, some of the exotic blitzes that we saw the uh, Seahawks bring to the table against the Giants, if those are effective at generating pressure, um, then I think you could see a, a little bit of a muted offensive output here for the Bengals. Um, Seahawks as well, like, I know I remember talking to you after the Monday Night Football game against the Giants. I don't think that was all that impressive from that Seahawks offense, and they were up against a pretty beleaguered unit. Um, there was one kind of breakaway run from Kenneth Walker. There was one... Uh, you know, a set of missed tackles on George Fant that was a, just a huge explosive play. Otherwise, that was a really, really, really unimpressive output from the Seahawks. And it seems to me like they're going to be incentivized to come in with a little bit of a run-heavy approach here, considering that's sort of the weakness right now of the Bengals' defense. And so when I kind of stew all of these thoughts together, Seahawks' offense maybe not that explosive, maybe run-heavy, Bengals one-dimensional, you know, maybe Joe Burrow's not 100% healthy, going up against a secondary that can create tighter windows. I, I, to me, this looks like an obvious under. Um, I know it's gotten bet up. Uh, the weather's probably not going to be a factor right now. The afternoon weather forecast for Cincinnati calls for 14-mile-an-hour winds, 30-mile-an-hour gusts. That's not past the threshold where you're saying auto-under here. Um, but with a total of 45 and the fact that, you know, there is still some lingering concern in the back of my head that Joe Burrow's, uh, you know, it's going to have some mobility question marks, uh, and, you know, just in general, some, uh, some mechanical question marks, uh, that's enough for me to think that this game probably ends in the 23, 20 range. Uh, so under 45, it would be my angle of attack. And I guess, I guess there's been two way action on the side here, um, I thought when this hit three that it was going to stay there till the weekend, but there was some pretty sincere money that came in and back to Seattle here. So uh, the sharp signal is pretty muddled. I don't exactly know what uh, you know the the, the true um, you know right side here is in terms of sort of the market makers' thoughts. Uh, and I guess just because it's under three, 
you know, I would lean Bengals, but uh, I really don't have a ton of appetite to get involved in the side. I'm just going to stick with an under. Yeah, I think it's a very difficult game to have a strong opinion on, given that no one knows exactly what Joe Burrow is going to look like. I thought he looked better and more spry. He had that 10-yard scramble uh, up the middle against Arizona where he seemed to be moving with relative confidence and look kind of pattering your feet for a 10-yard scramble is a different mechanic to planting your leg and throwing it 60 yards in the air to Jamar Chase, though he was able to do that uh, as well, at least perhaps off his front leg, as you noted. So I think it's difficult to yeah have a lot of confidence. The interesting thing to me is that Burrow said that the second time he did the calf, it was different uh, because he obviously he did it in the preseason and at training camp. And then he did it against the Ravens in week right. two. And he said when he did it against the Ravens, it wasn't quite as bad. So it was kind of like in his head, he was treating it as two different types of injuries to the same calf. And so maybe he's just recovering quicker. I would expect that just given how he looked last week, he will be fine coming out of the bye. We'll see what he looks like this week against Seattle. I mean, they need to win this game because if they don't, then you're looking at two and four uh, with a difficult schedule to come. So I think it'll be all hands on deck for this. To me, the most interesting thing outside of Burrow's health is just, is there a chance that this Seattle defense is actually good? Because it wasn't very good last year. Uh, I was kind of carried by the offense. And I mean, they do have talent on the defense between uh, particularly Tariq Wollin and, and Devin Witherspoon. And we'll see what happens with Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs had a rough start to the season, but still has pedigree. Uh, it's still Bobby Wagner there. Uh, they don't really have a pass rush, despite sacking Daniel Jones 10 times. I think that was more about the Giants' offensive line and their woes. But there is a chance that the Seahawks might have a decent defense, so they might be better than anticipated. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if they lose this game, but uh, I will not be betting anything the side and total here. My only bet around either of these two teams at the moment, Drew, is Jamar Chase at 20 to 1 to win off Offensive Player of the Year, which mm -hmm. I think his odds are just... The thing with that market is when it was CMC, Tyreek, and Justin Jefferson, it's just so hard for an outsider to break up those... to break up three guys who are so clearly in front. It's easier to break up two guys because now Jefferson is done in that market. Now it's just Tyreek and CMC. Tyreek is, they're not playing him fully, 100%. Like he's skipping parts of games. And then with CMC, I mean, he's a running back. So there's attrition there and he didn't have a very good game against the Cowboys by his standards. So I think that market's a little more open and Chase is second in the league in receptions and targets and you know, he's a fair way behind Tyreek, but he's the type of player who can have 192 yards and three touchdowns in a game like mm -hmm. he did last week and bridge the gap. Uh, so what do you think of Chase, who I think now should be considered the third favorite in that market? I think that's a fun way to try to capture the upside that the Bengals just get right. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I was, and actually what's kind of funny, and I was going to ask your opinion on this before we wrap Bengals talk, I had finger over the button on Bengals plus 422 to win the North yesterday. Um, part of the reason the Browns seem to be coming unglued, the Steelers are not good, uh, and the Ravens have just as hard of a schedule as the Bengals um, and, you know, really left the door wide open losing that game to the Steelers. So um, I think the Bengals are alive to come back into the playoff picture, albeit through the AFC North door or the wild card door. Uh, and if they are in the mix for a playoff spot, we know that they have a lot of high-profile games at the end of the season. Um, and Jamar Chase performing well in those big moments would obviously elevate his consideration for the award. Uh, and you could get into a situation here where a 10-win Bengals team, I mean, and 10 wins is not out of the realm of expectation. If you kind of are using any kind of preseason prior and saying Burrow's fine now, I think you're expecting them to get to 10. Uh, and a 10-win Bengals team is probably making a, at least a wild card in the AFC, uh, and you could potentially do better at a 20 to one type of swing on Jamar chase for offensive player of the year than a 422 price for the Bengals to win the North. If they end up coming through the back door in the, uh, in the wild card with the Ravens somehow performing well enough down the stretch to, to stay like one game ahead or to win the tie break over the Bengals. So um, I was kind of going back and forth on what to do here. 
Bengals North or pass. I think uh, I think the third third choice of better payout captures some of the upside of the Bengals getting back into the race with the Chase offensive player of the year is exactly the right call. Yeah, and the thing with Chase as well is one, he clearly has the pedigree. He came into the season as the favorite for this award in some spots. We're five weeks in. He hasn't tanked his numbers. The team's two and three, and they're favorites to be three and three entering the bye. So I just think it's gone a little bit too far. I don't agree with Stefan Diggs being favored over Chase. I just don't see the upside for Diggs and also the fact that he just his his numbers, Josh Allen's passing numbers, fall off in the second half of every year as it gets cold in Buffalo and you just lose like two games randomly where you just don't have a prayer of getting to 90 yards because of the wind or the weather. And Chase has to deal with weather more than, you know, CMC or Tyreek. But at the same time, like Diggs just doesn't, the type of player he is, he just doesn't have like 200-yard games like Chase and Tyreek are able to just because of just because of their speed, really. Sure. They're just faster than Stefan Diggs. And so I think those guys have a bit more upside. Tyreek is definitely the front runner just with the stats that he's yeah. banked and the offense that he's in. But uh, I think yeah. Chase is is the next guy. And if you're looking for a way into that market, I think he's the best bet. Yeah. Final couple ways to batter this discussion. Um, Chase is doing some new things, interestingly. Uh, some new scheme wrinkles that were integrated by Zach Taylor in the last game. Um, I there was a, There were some lingering whiffs of... Bengals offense has been solved. It's just 11 personnel. Like he just put a bunch of defensive backs out there. Chase is only running this, these handful of routes. Well, now he's doing a little bit more. Um, and I think that's noteworthy. The fact that Chase is out there with uh, Higgins, who's a little obviously limited, limited participant in practice this week. He says he's going. Um, Boyd obviously is out there as well. However, those guys are a little bit of cover for him as opposed to really taking away his target share. Uh, and then uh, kind of final thoughts, Terry Kill is fragile because he's at the whim of a healthy Tua which could be, who knows, uh, haven't ever seen him play 17 games. If this is the first year, then maybe Tyreek Hill just runs away with it. But considering the disparity in the prices between those two players, um, uh, I would lean Chase pretty heavily. And then uh, CMC, I think he's going to drift a little bit in terms of the glory because the Niners can beat you so many different ways. Uh, you have three weeks in a row where it's Kittle and then Debo and then Ayuk people kind of oh yeah like why what why, why, you know you know he he was high on the back of a four touchdown performance where he was the featured guy but there's going to be plenty of weeks in this offense where he's not the featured guy uh, and i think that could ultimately uh you know it's going to cause his you know he's going to regress yep yep it's brock purdy's team true uh yeah i make chase <laughs> 12 to 1 fair in that market so i think he's a better pretty much every price out there okay. okay before we get to lions bucks a reminder the bet the edge isn't the only show every weekday during the nfl season you can also check out the fantasy football happy hour with matthew barry connor rogers and myself it airs live on peacock at noon eastern Riaz at 4 p.m and is available on our NFL, on NBC Sports YouTube channel, as well as wherever you listen to your podcasts. Okay, Lions are three-point favorites at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The total is 42.5. The Bucs somehow are three and one. Mike Evans has not been practicing. Seems like he's trending in the wrong direction. Sam Laporta didn't practice today, which, you know, before the season you might not have thought was a big deal, but apparently... Uh, he's the greatest rookie tight end in NFL history uh, and can't even sniff offensive rookie of the year buzz because of how loaded that field is. Now, to me, what's most interesting about this game, Drew, is just how you rate Detroit. Because I think if you ask the NFL fan, they would tell you that Detroit and Dallas are not that far apart as teams, particularly coming off that Dallas uh, demolition by San Francisco, but the market is treating Detroit as about two and a half points better than your average team, and Dallas is five points better than your average team. Do you think Detroit are closer to that kind of tier two of Dallas Philly in the NFC beneath San Francisco, or do you think they are kind of a pretty clear kind of tier three by themselves? Hmm. That's a fun question. Um, neutral rating, I think they're clearly in tier two. Uh, neutral rate, you know, current team rating combined with ease of schedule. I think they are clearly in the race for a top two seed in the NFC. I think they're probably the only team. Uh, and again, like I get it. The Eagles haven't lost either. Like just be patient. Like the, the schedule is going to catch up to them at some point. Uh, I, and this is not anything against the Eagles at all. Like I would have the Eagles 
power rate. I would have probably put the, at the Eagles as a pick 'em or even small favorite in uh, Detroit if that's your two three matchup in the playoffs. Um, but I think the the Lions are the only team I think realistically that can get that can stockpile enough wins to steal the one seed from the Niners right now. Um, and part of the reason that I'm maybe higher than market a bit here on Detroit is because right now their defense is grading out as elite for me which is surprising and i don't know whether to kind of attribute that to um you know who they played like they played some bad quarterbacks like well we can be completely honest about that um you know any any time that carolina is on your schedule in the rearview mirror like yeah your stats are going to be a little bit padded um but that said uh you know they're turning the ball over you, you can you can take their defensive stats Let's let's ex- ex- exclude turnovers. Let's exclude fourth downs. Uh, let's exclude garbage time. They're grading just about as well right now as the Ravens and the Browns, and that's notable. I think the fact that they've had losses to their secondary and it hasn't re- meaningfully Im- affected them. That's credit to their staff developing these young players uh, to be able to step in and uh, and help backfill uh, in the secondary. And they have elite pass rush now. Production from Aiden Hutchinson combined with a huge step forward from Alan McNeil. Like all of a sudden, this is a good deep team. Um, Brian Branch matters a ton. He was not practicing this week. I definitely am very concerned, or not concerned, but I'd very much like to see uh, what you know him take the field uh, against the Buccaneers before any making any kind of a play on that game. Um, but when he's available, he is sort of the X factor because he's so good in run defense that it gives you the opportunity to play lighter sets uh, and kind of cover up some of the key questions you might have in your coverage. And so it's crazy for me to say this, but I think the Lions are a top 10 defense pretty clearly, maybe a top five. Um, and that's with the, the considering the losses of Emmanuel Mosley, who played what one snap for them this season and CJ GJ, who was sort of like their clear on the field emotional leader in that Chiefs win week one. Um, so it's it's uh, it's wild that the Lions are this good. But I think that's the reality we live in right now. Um, and basically with the way Ben Johnson is coordinating the offense with the skill position players they have uh, with the, as good as this offensive line is. They're basically mini, mini San Francisco. Like uh, the similarities are very, they're San Francisco light, San Francisco JV, whatever you want to call it. Like they're not that far in terms of just how you cookie cutter a team and, uh, you know, kind of look at their identity. It's pretty doggone close. And so I think um, they should be taken seriously. The fact that they're three point favorites on the road this week against a team that's coming off a bye that's already won three games should tell you that they are being taken seriously to a degree. Um, and as we look at just how do we handicap this particular game, I'm fascinated by the fact that there was some pretty sharp money this came in this morning and, you know, cracked this under singularly. Didn't mess with the side, just played the under. It's down to 42 and a half right now. That is a non trivial move. Uh, and I think uh, the first thing I did when I saw that was look at the updated AccuWeather forecast for Tampa, Florida. Uh, it was pouring rain and flash flooding and storms there today. It's going to rain tomorrow. It's going to rain Saturday, but it looks like the weather is going to be pretty good on Sunday afternoon. Uh, this is a, a 4 p.m. kickoff. We're looking at like temperatures in the 80s. Uh, um, winds in the 10 mile an hour range, wind gusts in the 30 mile an hour range. So it, it could be a little weird. It could be a little wind swirling, affecting some special teams, things like that. Um, but uh, the bigger concern, maybe just of player availability uh, for the offensive pieces for the Lions, I guess. Um, Laporta, you mentioned, didn't practice today or, you know, d- didn't participate in practice today with the calf injury, it turns out. Um, it looks like, uh, but it looks like the offensive line is going to be relatively full strength here. Here. Um, and uh, you know, it was rest for Frank Rag now, who missed practice. Amon Ross St. Brown looks like he's coming back and will go. Uh, no Jameer Gibbs, uh, but the way David Montgomery's playing, I'm not sure that matters. Uh, the real name to circle, at least in terms of following the Friday report, is going to be for me, Brian Branch. I'd like to see if he is a DNP or a limited participant tomorrow, um, because he definitely matters in terms of defending the Buccaneers. Uh, Buccaneers are a one-dimensional offense as well. We talked about that with the way that the Cincinnati Bengals are playing right now. It's even more severe with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They have no sniff, no semblance, no nothing going on in the run game. It is all on Baker Mayfield's shoulder. And so if Alan McNeil, if Aiden Hutchinson, if those guys get going pass rush-wise, they can definitely help the Lions play with a positive game state. 
Uh, and then if it's comeback mode for the Buccaneers and you're one dimensional, um, you know, I mean, maybe they have enough talent in the uh, wide receiver room to really uh, move the needle and make things competitive. But, uh, you know, M- Mike Evans also limited participant today. My guess is he goes with the hamstring. Um, I just don't have much confidence at all in this Tampa Bay offensive line doing enough to keep, uh, you know, Baker Mayfield up right here when he's under pressure. He's not the same quarterback. Uh, and I think ultimately this is probably lines or pass. And uh, according to the market, this is an underplay. Yeah, I think the sneaky thing here is that uh, Jared Goff is no good when exposed to weather. Uh, and we haven't really seen him exposed to weather uh, yet in a way that has really hurt the team outside of Kansas City on the opening night where, again, he didn't have to do a ton. And he's going up against Kansas City defense that was missing Chris Jones. Uh, I mean, they played at Lambeau, but again, that was what David Montgomery ran the ball 33 times. So that is the thing with Goff. The the other sneaky thing, though, about the Lions is that uh, their last 10 games, they're exposed to the weather once. Uh, and it's against Chicago, who have the worst secondary in the NFL. So it's about as smooth as you could imagine for Jared Goff. He's going to play some decent defenses in that stretch, but man, not really a couple. He's going to have to play Dallas, the Saints. But for the most part, it should be pretty easy for Goff. So uh, we may only learn uh, if he's made significant strides once we get to the playoffs. He's the number one quarterback by PFF grade right now, Jared Goff, which I can't, I just can't have it. I just, uh, I've watched too much Lions this year to, and seen some of his picks that I just don't start. Yeah, he's number one. And uh, Brock Purdy is number eight. And as someone who's watched a lot of both of those teams, uh, certainly to me, at least, that uh, it felt like Purdy was the better quarterback, independent of my bets in the MVP market. But uh, I agree. The Lions' defense seems very solid. We'll see. They really haven't had to play much. I think they're a little bit inflated because Kadarius Tony and Sky Moore couldn't catch a pass in week one. And if they had just caught the ball uh, from Patrick Mahomes more frequently, then the Lions' defensive numbers would take a bit of a hit. But one thing with the Lions is that I've talked about this. Aiden Hutchinson, who doesn't quite have the rep yet of Micah Parsons, Miles Garrett, TJ Watt, his mm-hmm. past 10 games, he's been as good as those guys. There's now a 10-game sample of him just being an absolute monster. He has four interceptions already in his career. Uh, his, he's leading the league in pressures. I think Austin Gale tweeted something very interesting where if you look at the time that the quarterback spends in the pocket until uh, – and like and a pass rusher basically when they get their pressure uh on the clock and a lot of hutchinson's pressures come when the quarterback has been holding the ball for like over three and a half seconds and so one i think that shows that probably doesn't have the athleticism of a tj water or miles garrett or michael parsons to beat his man immediately but he does have the relentlessness just to mm-hmm. stay in the play and he's got an amazing motor uh and he's if uh if you hang around too long he will get you and he's uh, yeah, I think he's a legitimate defensive player of the year candidate. I think the gap between those that big three and him is too pronounced. Uh, and I would have him, you know, in, in single figures for that award. So I do think the Lions are legitimate. Uh, I don't think they're quite at the level of being, you know, a contender to knock down San Francisco. Uh, and I would have them behind the Cowboys and the Eagles. But uh, I think they're clearly the fourth best team in the NFC. Okay, so real quick to close the loop on quarterback great rating, I'm surprised that they're grading him first. Yeah, numero uno. He's uh, he's yeah. number he's number eight for me. Uh, I have pretty much a dead heap between Purdy and two at the top. Then it goes um, Mahomes, Josh Allen. Uh, then it is Jalen Hurts, Justin Herbert for me, and I have Lamar Jackson ahead of him as well. So Goff is my uh, my number eight right now. But that's good. Yeah, he's had a good start to the season. He's a fine quarterback when he's got a great offensive line and uh, and he doesn't have to get rained on um, by (laughs) the weather in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of EPA and CPOE composite, he is eighth, uh, just like where you've got him. So I think that's about where he's been. That's his level. All right, Bills Mafia will be out in full force this Sunday night when Josh Allen and company take on supposedly Daniel Jones and the Giants in Buffalo. Coverage of the game starts at 7 p.m. Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. 
I think there's a ton interesting about this game uh, that is being broadcast on our network. We can put Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. Could be a Tyrod Taylor revenge game, but is there any way that you're betting this? I came very close to doing something stupid and playing some giants in some positive way. And then I walked away and I took a deep, I took a deep breath and I said, you know what? Let's take a look at the injury report tomorrow before you do anything outrageous here. The injury report for the giants is unbelievable on offense right now. They basically have four of their preferred starting linemen who are not practicing uh, throw well, three who are not practicing one who is two and three who are not practicing and uh, three who are limited participants participants in practice. Um, but the way that I kind of read the tea leaves, I think four of their five are not going to go. Uh, Evan Neal is probably the only guy that you can realistically expect to go. And even if he does, he's not getting all of the reps he should be getting and he's not playing well anyway. So it's, it's absolutely crazy to see Andrew Thomas still did not participate the center uh, John Michael Schmitz did not participate. Matt Pert did not participate. Uh, Shane Lemieux, Lemieux, Marcus McKeithen, like that. This is unbelievable that they are down to second unit everywhere. And we've seen the first unit not perform well. It's very hard for me to believe that the second unit steps in and gives any kind of time to whoever is the quarterback which might not be Daniel Jones because he did not participate with the neck injury. And so Tarod Taylor behind an absolute makeshift of an offensive line with a receiving core that can't create separation and a tight end who's, you know, uh, uh, so oft injured at this point that I'm legitimately surprised to see him running around out there. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe Saquon Barkley shows up and takes some of the heat off of uh, Matt Breida, but like, the, the degree to which there is no help coming offensively for this unit is unbelievable to me. Um, they basically have a cluster injury on offense. Um, the best possible thing that could have happened for the Bills was to face a team that had a cluster injury on offense <laughs> because the Bills have now lost their most important player at all three levels, in my opinion. Uh, I think losing Daquan Jones is understated. I didn't know he was going to be good on done for the season. I thought he was going to be coming back. He is done for the season. Matt Milano is done for the season. He's their most important defensive player, period. Most important linebacker. And Trey White, who they lost last week or the week prior to going to London, most important player in their secondary because he can provide elite coverage. Uh, I don't know how you now hold this together with you know sticks and twine. Um, this is probably as soft of a test as you could have ever possibly hoped for. You just, maybe you send a little bit of exotic pressures here and there, really get after Trout Taylor, uh, have some negative, negative plays via sack, maybe a strip fumble, who knows. But uh, I think you are very fortunate to be getting the soft landing that is Giants this week, Patriots next week um, to figure things out. Uh, but the Bills defense was rating okay for me in a neutral game state through the Jags game. And now with these losses, I'm expecting them to be pretty bad. And it's going to be up to Josh Allen to kind of in, put this team on his back and carry them to a wild card spot, maybe an AFC East title at this point. Um, but uh, almost all of my enthusiasm for future stuff related to the Bills is out the window. Uh, I don't love Josh Allen under pressure where he is, not under pressure of pass pressure, but under pressure of having to do too much. <laughs> like I think he operates a little bit better uh, when he is asked to do a little bit less. Um, but all this said, uh, you know, the, the Bills should be able to get into the 20s here, and I don't know how the Giants are getting out of the single digits. Um, so this is, uh, this is a fairly lopsided, uh, you know, market for a good reason. Um, I could see this even getting to 14 and a half. Uh, it looks like it's on its way. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a, it's a rough, uh, scene because this would have been a fun game to talk about. You know, like if like preseason, we would have pitched this like is Josh is Daniel Jones the next Josh Allen? Brian Dable coming back with his you know his his playoff. You know that the the Bills and the Giants made it to the same stage as the playoffs last year, Jake, <laughs> <laughs> and and they both went out unceremoniously in week two. And uh, boy, oh boy, this is uh, quite a turn of fortune. Yeah, I I think it's an interesting experiment from a market making 
perspective just how you quantify how bad this Giants offensive line is because it just it renders their offense completely non-viable. Uh, and then it's interesting if these players who are playing terribly are also going to miss this game, then how does it really get worse? Like how much worse can it actually get? Like they're just getting beaten immediately and their quarterback's being sacked 10 times. Uh, so from that perspective, I think it's a hard one for the market in a way to figure out. Uh, in terms of the Bills, I'd be a little bit more bullish on them as a team going forward just because they don't have injuries on offense. The offense sure. is fine, and I think the offense will be, you know, it certainly has the potential to be a top three unit at the end of the season. The offensive line, I think, is playing a bit better than it has in years past. Gabe Davis is healthy, unlike he, and he wasn't last year. Allen is playing well. Cook is a better running back than they've had previously, I think, and Stefan Diggs is a top five wide receiver. And then on defense, it's not, yeah, they're missing a lot of guys now between, <laughs> as you mentioned, Trey White, Daquan Jones, and Matt Milano, who are all, all done. Uh, Daquan Jones, there's a chance he may return in the playoffs, but he's not going to play the next the next two, three months. So it's not great, but at the same time, Von Miller will get more up to speed. They've Leonard Floyd on the edge now as well. Russo will come back. Uh, they'll have... You know, they'll have some help opposite Dane Jackson. It's not always just going to be Kaya Elam. And they have, you know, Micah Hyde, they didn't have last year. So I do think there is the pathway for this to be a decent enough defense with an elite offense in an AFC that I think is filled with more flawed teams than it had last year. Like the Bills last year and the Chiefs last year, to me, were probably more imposing than their current iterations. And the Bengals aren't as good. And we'll see with the Ravens and Jags and other teams. But I don't think all hope is lost yet for the Bills. And to your point earlier, they get the Giants, then at the Patriots, and then they're home for Tampa. And then they have a long break until, you know, they really hit the meat of their schedule, starting with that Cincinnati uh, in a Sunday night football game. On NBC, so I think the Bills will still be heard from, uh, but certainly their dogs in their division now to Miami. Oh man, that Cincinnati game! It's a big one. It's a big yeah. one. It's gonna be, uh, could be loser goes home in terms of you know Cincinnati for the division and well, so, well, yeah, Bills for well, that. No, let's 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 talk through this a little more. Uh, Bills probably win the next three, even with the beleaguered defense. Um, they're yeah, they'll they 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 may be even be you know depending on what happens with Miami against Philly and some of the other Miami games between now and then aren't as easy certainly as Giants Panthers. Um, but uh, yeah, the the you know the potential for the Bills to kind of be clearly in a playoff spot when they play the Bengals is is very real. I'm gonna cross my fingers that uh, Sean McDermott does keep it together with the tape, with the duct tape and the, you know, the six and the twine here um, until that Cincinnati game. And then I think at that point we're talking, we're talking bombs away on Cincinnati. Uh, I mean, this is cause, I, cause I'll be honest with you, the Buffalo bills defense EPA play. If you just click through all that stuff, it looks good. It looks like they've done well. And you're like, well, how much could they? Maybe they'll backfill. They do have, everything you said is correct. They have a bunch of reinforcements coming on the pass rush and stuff like that. But a lot of their EPA per play are turnovers from Sam Howell in one game. Like it has been wildly tilted by those turnovers so far this season. You take those out, and this defense all is like not close to, uh, you know, good levels so far this year. So, um, I'm I uh, I will cross my fingers that uh, the fact that they play the likes of the Giants, the Patriots, the Broncos, and the Jets. I mean, they they get some very favorable matchups between now and when we get into uh, like the Thanksgiving time frame. Um, we might have some absolute all-time fades, Buffalo at Cincinnati, Buffalo at Philadelphia, and Buffalo at Kansas City. If they win any of those three, if they if they can hold their opponents under 30 in any of those three games, Sean McDermott has not gotten enough credit as a defensive genius. This is why I'm so against Josh Allen MVPs, because he's got to still play at Cincinnati, at Philly, at Kansas City, Dallas, at Chargers, at Miami. And he's probably going to have to go five and one in those games to win MVP. Because if you start getting to four, certainly five losses in the AFC, then he's not going to win, particularly given they play in a division with the Dolphins. And if they got five losses, they're almost, they're probably not winning the AFC East. And if you don't win your division, you cannot win MVP these days. 
All right, before we get to our best bets, a reminder that Saturday, 14th of October at 11 a.m. Eastern, Vaughn Dalzell, Brad Thomas, and Eric Froton are answering your college football betting questions for week seven, including a primetime battle between USC and Notre Dame in South Bend on NBC and Peacock at 7 p.m. Eastern. Also of note, Caleb Williams is no longer the Heisman favorite. Michael Penix Jr. of Washington has overtaken him atop the board in the market. All right, best bets for week six. I will kick us off. I am taking the Saints minus one and a half at the Texans. I think it's very concerning that the Texans made Desmond Ritter look like peak Joe Montana and seem to fix him. Uh, there's around an 88 PFF grade uh, against uh, against the Texans. That was higher than Brock Purdy's uh, PFF grade against the Cowboys in his uh, breakout performance. Uh, and Ritter looked great, and he made great throws, but still he shouldn't be allowing Desmond Ritter to do that. Uh, and then on the other side, yes, the Texans are getting healthier uh, with their offensive line. Stroud has been great. Everyone focuses on the lack of interceptions with Stroud. To me, it's the fact he hasn't taken a sack in three weeks. I don't even understand how it's possible. He's great, but... Uh, Tank Dell under an injury cloud. Uh, the Houston offense just they cannot run the ball. They just cannot be efficient on the ground. And I think the Saints, I think people were a little thrown off the scent of the Saints because they were so bad against the Bucs. But Derek Carter just wasn't healthy in that game. Mm-hmm. He was not right. right. That team seemed to get a lot more right against the Patriots. Uh, and I think they're the best team in the NFC South. And I think that they should be able to handle the Texans. Uh, what's your best bet? Yeah, it's hard to come up with the best bet this week. I'll be completely frank with you. This is the first week of the season where I've been like, man, the what's going on? Everything looks pretty fair. <clears throat> the one I'm going to lean on is a little bit of a situational, um, trying to capture a little bit of uh, uh, the other side of the coin. Uh, we went with Eagles last week against the Rams. A part of that handicap was the fact that the Rams tra- are a very young team and they have traveled a lot over the early portion of the season. They had weak second half performances against the Bengals, the Colts, and the Eagles in three straight weeks. I would attribute that almost certainly to fatigue. They now have had a full week at home, full week of normal rest and recovery, no travel, uh, and they welcome a team in the Cardinals who has now been pretty clearly exposed and likes to run a style of defense that allows lots of intermediate space when you are up against elite wide receivers. And don't look now, but the Rams might have the best trio of wide receivers with a healthy Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua, and Tutu Atwell. These guys are all very, they have different set, different skill sets and different ways they can hurt you. And Matt Stafford is playing at a top 10 level just behind Jared Goff, ironically, in my rankings. Number nine is Matt Stafford, a hair below Jared Goff. Um, and I like, uh, I like the, op- the fact that, um, uh, you know, Jared Goff has come undone. I mean, excuse me, Matt Stafford has come undone to a degree uh, when you've gotten interior pressure on him. Uh, and that is because his offensive line, as they have gone through games, have gotten exhausted and played poorly in second halves and have been up against some pretty elite pass rushes, which the Cardinals do not bring to the table here. So um, I don't mind laying the points of the Rams even at seven. I think this is potential to get out of hand uh, pretty early and often. Uh, I think Aaron Donald might make an appearance in this game as he's going up against a weak interior O line. Uh, and I think uh, this could be uh, like a 30 to 10 kind of a final score. So uh, I'm going to lay the points with the Rams. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm back. I'm back with the Ramley after a, uh, a weird start to the season where I was uh, I was, you know, pretty anti L.A. I think now is the time to start buying these guys. Yeah, I think the Cardinals kind of became themselves uh, on the weekend against the Bengals. Sneaky thing with Stafford as well. He has five picks so far which is tied for sixth in the league but by pff's turnover worthy play percentage he's 20 he's basically 28th out of 31 so in a, in a good way like he's not making turnover worthy plays it's just he's getting unlucky uh and i think that his underlying performance backs up the fact that you know he's playing like a top 10 quarterback at the moment so i am with you there on the rams all right we are done a reminder that people can go back through the past shows in our podcast feed and on youtube for handicaps of other nfl games this week uh in the meantime don't forget to check out nbcsports.com for more information to help you with your wages please rate and subscribe if you're listening to us as a podcast 
And also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to amazon.com slash NBC Sports. From Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick, good luck this weekend and we'll see you next week.